Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and this will hopefully be a quick video, but we all know how that goes every time I say that. Um, anyway, about the video about the Ryzen 5 3600 and the sort of daily stable overclock um, that I set out to create in the previous video about this. Because not literally the previous video, like, what you, you get, you get the idea. Anyway. Um, you'll notice that I've, I'm, I'm using a AIO on, on, the, on the CPU, and a really big one at that. This is a 280 CLC from, e, uh, EV, from EVGA, uh, and I've got two Corsair 140, uh, ML140s um, on it for, for the fans. So, yeah, basically the cooling system costs almost as much as the CPU does, which is, I still think it's dumb to do that, but... Um, there, there's two things to this. One, the Wraith Prism is actually just not enough for cooling the th R5 3600. Um, if you're gonna be, like, if you manually overclock, it's just not enough. So, actually, like, overclocking on the stock cooler is, in, in my opinion, uh, just completely impossible. Because even with the Wraith Prism, the, like, the Wraith Prism isn't good enough. Uh, and this is like this is actually doing a great job, but th this is really, really, like the, the the this I'd say is leaning heavily overkill. So the thing is, I've also thought about like, you know, the pricing situation. And the thing is like, between the Ryzen five thirty six hundred and the ten six hundred K slash thirty seven hundred X, you don't really have a lot of choice. Um, and I don't remember the prices right now, so I'm just gonna look them up. Um, but, uh, basically, if we, why, man, okay, wait, where, what, why isn't the 10600K anywhere? This is really stupid. Okay, so 10600K is $290, um, and the 3600 is $175, so the, the thing is, that is a big, big gap in price points, and the 3700X is like $280, so still a big gap. And so basically, if you buy a 3600 or more like if you have a build where it's like, oh, I want to improve my performance somehow and you already have like, I don't know, a 2070 Super or and you have a good kit of memory and then it's just like, OK, so what what else can you adjust about your build other than, well, the cooling system? Because the thing is, um, if you spend $50 more um, with your Ryzen 5 3600, you're going to get a significantly better cooler, right? Um, and you're still going to be spending less money than upgrading all the way to like a 3700X or a, or a 10600K. Now, it does get kind of weird once you approach like $100 because that's about the, right? Like if you're going to spend $100 on your cooler, you may as well just buy a 3700X in my opinion. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, you know, like, like it's, so it's not completely like, I still think the hundred plus dollar AIO I'm running here, definitely not like a realistic cooling system for a Ryzen 5 3600. Like if you do this, you're like, in my opinion, you are not spending your money optimally. It's not my money though. So I'm not going to stop you. Um, and I guess if, you know, you know for a fact that the games you play don't scale above six scores or just don't scale very high, then it's just like, yeah, this doesn't really, like, it, it makes sense to maybe just dump more cooling on the problem. Though at the same time, I would argue that maybe you should just go Intel instead. Um, anyway, um, so basically the unrealistic, the unrealism of the cooling system aside... This actually works really, really well and makes a noticeable difference to the overclocking compared to the Wraith Prism, which I really didn't expect. So uh, right now, as you can see, uh, the system is running Prime 95. Um, it's been running from, oh, like, it's not actually 04, but uh, right now we're on 0. Um, so it's been running for over an hour now, just a little bit over an hour. And the voltage has been hovering around the 1.275 volt range the entire time. Temperatures are around 85 degrees. Um, and the thing is, the temperature is actually very important for the stability. So on the Wraith Prism, with slightly lower voltages, uh, I was running like over, like approaching 95 degrees. And the crazy thing is, I couldn't stabilize the CPU until I was all the way down to like 4.2 gigahertz. Which is ultimately why I ended up swapping to the... 
to the uh, EVGA CLC 280 because I was just like, I am not making a video about overclocking a Ryzen 3600 from its stock 4.1 gigahertz-ish multi-core boost to 4.2 all-core on an air cooler because I don't have enough cooling. So I swapped the cooling system out and well, the temperature drop alone pretty much stabilized 4.3 gigahertz. Um, so that is like really neat. Um, as far as I'm concerned, like, yeah, that, that's, that's cool. Um, and the, yeah, and so that's the main thing is like, so Ryzen's are very, like, if you're running your Ryzen CPU at over 90 degrees, then, you know, if you somehow manage to force it down to 85 degrees, that will actually probably make a noticeable difference to the stability when, when running a stress test, because I basically picked up 100 megahertz by lowering the te operating temperature, which is like, like, I'm not super, like, like, it's a lot, but at the same time, it's, it, like, it makes sense to me that something like that would be possible. So, uh, yeah, I, at the same time, I still think that the 280 is just not realistic for a Ryzen 5 3600. Like, really, you should, you should get a 3700X before that. Though, at the same time, like, it does make me wonder, like, a 3900, right, the, uh, the 3900X is just, like, that's a 12 core. That thing is going to be incredibly difficult to cool no matter what you do because it literally produces twice as much heat as a 3600 while also having basically the same thermal density. So, like, yeah, once you hit, like, a 3700X, I'd argue maybe, it, well, you could still go for a 10700K instead, I guess. Anyway, so, CPU considerations aside... Yeah, the cooling system actually makes a noticeable difference to the to st the stability of the overclock. Uh, also, closing the window makes a noticeable difference to the temperatures. Like, th th this max temperature has only been hit now that I close the window. Anyway, um, so, yeah, so th this, this is running Prime95 just fine. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's been running a bunch of different uh, FFT sizes. Um... If we scroll through here, right, you can see it's been running a bunch of different FFT sizes. And so the way I uh, way I actually do, like, full-blown, you know, stress tests like this is I punch in uh, 32K all the way up to 256K. Um, though for, like, an Intel system, I would be using, like, 32K up to, like, 192K. Because the thing is, like, Ryzen's are different in that because they have a lot of L3 cache, they can actually go up to larger FFT sizes before before the power consumption drops off a cliff. Um, with Intel CPUs, once you go past like 192, they just run really, really cold. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so I test from 32K to 256K on Ryzen because that hits all of the hottest FFTs, um, and they all have slightly different power, like the power draw behavior and memory usage behavior and like cache usage behavior. Um, and then I have them just cycling uh, like every minute um and so you just start it up like that and it'll just go through every single fft size um that from 32k ffts all the way up to 256 uh on a one minute interval per fft size so um yeah anyway so that that's how i like to use uh prime 95 for for stress testing so I'm just going to stop the test. Um, the performance that this is currently getting, which if I remember correctly, wait, this is R20. No, we want R15. Because R20 takes way too long to run. Also, you'll notice, like, Cinebench runs ice cold. Right? I, yeah, C Cinebench does not run hot at all. We should run R20 just for, for a comparison, because the funny thing is, like, R20 actually has AVX, but at least um, in my past testing, the power consumption difference between R15 and R20 is basically non-existent. So, yeah, like, for reasonable workloads, this overclock will actually run under 70 degrees. So, um, yeah, like, th this is great. Um, <laughs> we have way too much cooling, arguably. Yeah, and R20 runs around the same temperature. And similar voltage as well. Slightly lower. 
So, yeah, R20 and R15, like, in terms of actual, like, intensity, they're not very different. Um, R15 is just shorter, which is why I prefer using it for checking. Like, for a Ryzen 3600, 15 is long enough that you can use it for checking the performance. The main reason why R20 exists is because if you get to, like, 32 core CPUs, R15 finishes so quickly that it becomes really inaccurate um, because of how the benchmark works. But, yeah. Anyway, so as you can also see right now, the, the CPU is idling at 1.33 volts, which is completely fine because uh, if you run the CPU on stock settings and you run Cinebench, it actually runs Cinebench at around 1.3 volts. So, you know, we can idle at 1.3 volts indefinitely because you can run a multi-core workload at 1.3 volts indefinitely. Um, so I'm not concerned about this because I know a lot of people, like, I know I know there's a lot of, uh, like, Ryzen is super sensitive to degradation, and I agree with that. But at the same time, it's just, like, the CPU, like, a stock Ryzen literally runs 1.33 volts under most workloads. And it only goes down to, like, one point, like the sub 1.3 volt range if you're running something like Prime 95. Though... The, the crazy thing is, with, uh, with the current cooling system on the CPU, if I run Prime95 with just PBO enabled, um, it will actually run 1.3 volts in Prime95. And I was very strongly considering, like, uh, raising the core voltage to see if I could maybe run 4.35 gigahertz, but at the same time, it's just like... like the thing is, there's also a temperature trade-off, where... Like, I could clearly see that the voltage was coming down as the load temperature goes up, and then as you add the fat, like, the other thing is as you increase the operating frequency, the current draw increases, therefore the maximum, say, voltage decreases as the operating frequency increases. Like, basically, I, this this is definitely, as far as I'm concerned, this is erring on the side of caution with my current voltage settings. So, uh, core voltage is set to 1.3375 volts. Um, I have mode 6 LLC, so there is tons of eDroop, which is why, you know, like Cinebench runs at around 1.3 volts with my current settings. Prime 95 runs at like 1.275. Um, and that's fine. Like we want the voltage, uh, we want the vDroop because uh, it helps the voltage regulation. Um, and it actually reduces our minimum required, like average, well, it reduces your average required load voltage for uh, um, stability. So that, that's why I'm running the V. Uh, that's why I'm running the the LLC at the settings that it's at. 400 millivolts, um, like maxed out voltage protection, because like the voltage is fine. Like <laughs> I've set it to a safe safe value. We don't need voltage protection. Overcurrent protection is enhanced, though. With this CPU, I don't think that actually changes anything. Switching frequency at 800 kilohertz. I'm not sure that it makes too much of a difference. But there's real like this VRM is incredibly overkill for this CPU, so there's really no harm in just cranking up the switching frequency. Um, though I do believe 1,000 kilohertz may be broken. Um, there, there's kind of like with with some other boards, the highest frequency settings don't always necessarily work. So that's why I don't normally go all the way up to one uh, one megahertz. Um, and then the OCP expander for 12 volts in is also enabled. Um, which I still, like, I don't really think that would do anything with a Ryzen 5 3600, but, eh. There's, like, I, we don't need limitations on the power draw of the CPU as far as I'm concerned. Other than that, XMP is enabled, and that's it. Like, that's all I've really done. Uh, CPU core ratio is set to 4.3 all core. I could probably push uh, CCX1 to 4.325 or 4.35 instead of just 4.3, but it wouldn't really make that much of a perf or overall performance difference. So yeah, uh, 4.3 it is. Now I'm just going to set that to auto. I'm also going to set this to auto and I'm going to set the LLC to auto um, because uh, I do have the PBO settings currently enabled. So we have 200 watt power limit, 155, uh, 155 current limits. The reason why I'm running these PBO settings is this is a Ryzen 5 3600. It's never going to need more current than like 100. Actually, it's never going to hit 100 amps. So, um, you know, I'm not concerned about having like the, the, the goal with uh, test doing a fit test 
uh, using the PBO settings is we want the CPU to not be running into a current limit or a power limit. We want the CPU to be running into the thermal and voltage limits, which um, that's sort of like the, the CPU basically decides what, what a safe operating voltage is based on the operating temperature. Um, and so, yeah, so that's why the PBO settings are what they are. Like, if this was a 3950X, I would be running 300 watts, 230, 230, because other, like, any, like if you set it lower, it actually power throttles. If you set it higher, uh, it also power throttles because AMD software sucks. Um, but anyway, and the Precision Boost Overdrive Scaler is set to 1X because at the higher settings, uh, it has some very strange effects on your uh, load voltages, so it's best to not change that because that'll give you an like unaltered um, safe voltage spec for the CPU. Um, this doesn't do anything. Uh, thermal throttle limit, I, I just leave that on auto. And these power limits down here as well are just set to 200 watts. So... And like now, I want to show you like the the like the CPU will on its own actually go to 1.3 volts in Prime 95. Which the thing is, if I actually set 1.35 volt, 1.3 volts, and then also ran 4.3 gigahertz, um, it would actually pull like it would almost be like the the CPU under current conditions will run like. Come on, load in. So let's get hardware info up. Because this is what I base my like voltage, like core voltage setting on, right? Is just like what what is what's safe for my CPU to run at? Well, okay, like right now we're idling, so that doesn't tell us anything because we're we're not running all of the cores. Because um, the thing is, when you manually overclock a Ryzen, it actually disables a lot of the really fancy power management, and so that that's why you won't like you wouldn't actually want to punch in something like 1.4 volts static because. Uh, all of the, the fancy power gating stuff is probably turned off and therefore your, your voltage is now way too high. So as you can see, like Cinebench, which is a multi-threaded workload, and admittedly this is not the AVX version of it, runs at 1.34 volts. So the CPU has determined that at less than 70 degrees, um, you know, it, it is safe to run 1.34 volts. For Cinebench, which, uh, like, that's that's quite up there. And, you know, you might be like, oh, but that's R15 and it doesn't have AVX. Well, uh, it doesn't, like, AMD, unlike Intel, doesn't have an AVX offset. So AMD's boost algorithm literally does everything based on power and temperature and voltage. So there's, like, you can't, like, basically the rules are you cannot exceed X voltage unless temperature is below Y value at, like... I think I've done a video about this like ages and ages ago about like the ge like the general idea of how a boost algorithm works. But yeah, so you can see R20 runs at the same kind of voltages because R20 puts the, roughly the same amount of load on the CPU. And so this is why I'm completely okay with letting the CPU idle at, you know, 1.33 volts because like it's running and dip down to 1.294 there for a little bit. But, um... Uh, yeah, like, it's running freaking Cinebench at 1.35, almost. So, maybe, oh, let's set that to, oh, I don't know, 50 milliseconds. Get the update right a bit faster. Yeah, so, you get the idea. Um, also, you know, the performance uplift wasn't that, he, like, that big, as you saw, um, Cinebench ran, what was it, C like, Cinebench 15 on the overclock was, like, just under 1700, and right now it ran just over 1600, but this is not stock performance, this is PBO, so PBO does slightly increase the, the performance, so anyway, let's run Prime 95, because this, this is the thing that, like, really surprised me with the cooler swap. We're going to run 128k uh, FFT size, which is one of the hottest FFT sizes you can run. Like, it, it just sits there at 1.3 volts. And like 80 degrees. Once it gets up to 85, it should drop to 1.3 volts. But right now it's just going to be at like 1.31, 1.32. 
So, oh, there we go. Now, now it's at, uh, yeah, so moves around a bit based on how much current is being pulled. But yeah, but this this right here is the main reason why I'm not concerned by the, the settings I punched into the BIOS because my Prime 95 load voltage is lower than what PBO itself will do um, when you remove the power limits. So we're not removing the voltage restriction, right? Because we actually can't remove the voltage. Well, the, the overdrive scaler is actually supposed to adjust the voltage restrictions. Um, and it kind of does that. It, it kind of does that. And I say kind of because it depends on what kind of workload. Like in some workloads, it's very noticeable. In other workloads, it doesn't really do anything. Um, but yeah, like I haven't adjusted the scaler. The scaler's at 1x. So the, the you know, the voltage restrictions that the CPU is running right now is just like, this is the absolute maximum voltage that is allowable for long-term reliability. And my load voltage is 1.275 volts. This thing is running almost one point, uh, is running around 1.3. I'm not concerned about punching in 1.33 volts in the BIOS, along with the level six LLC, which you know creates all the V-droop that gets it down to that 1.275 that I have it at. So, yeah, that's that's it. Hopefully, that made some sense. Um, and yeah, and the, the interesting thing, like the, to me, the most noteworthy thing is that swapping from the Wraith Prism to this cooler and bumping the voltage, I think 10 millivolts literally took me from going 4.2 gigahertz to doing 4.3, which is like, I, I, I can't, I still can't believe that it made that much of a difference. Like it makes sense. Cause, uh, the, the, the thing is like, well, I'm. I don't have like specific characteristics, like I don't know the exact characteristics of AMD seven nanometer manufacturing process, but basically um, temperature, like thermal effects are non-linear. So going from 85 degrees to 95 degrees is actually much, much worse than going from like 75 degrees than eight to 85 degrees. Um, and uh, the like, and the frequency on a lot of architectures, um, especially like, on a lot of very dense uh, chips, um, the thing that limits the frequency isn't so much your like operating voltage or or well much of it. Like, it it's not going to be something like voltage. A lot of the time, it's just like the hotspot temperature somewhere in the silicon. Like there's some some transistor somewhere which is very hot and very upset about it. Um, and so if you drop the temperature of that one transistor ten degrees or one you know part of the chip ten degrees. Um, then suddenly you get another 100 megahertz. It's like, yeah, that that's actually completely uh, possible. So anyway, um, yeah. So those are those are the final settings that I dialed in right there. Just 1.3375 um, mode six LLC with all the safeties disabled and 800 kilohertz switching frequency and 4.3 gigahertz all core. And now we have more single core performance than stock. We have more multi-core performance than stock. We have more, like all the time, this chip is just slightly faster than a stock uh, 3600. Um, if I had an even stronger cool, like if there, if there was some way to keep this chip below 80 degrees, like running, like if it was possible to run Prime 95 on, a C, on this CPU at like 75 degrees instead of 85 degrees without resorting to like exotic cooling systems or more like approachable exotic cooling systems, right? Not something, not, not something as uh, like, because the thing is, yeah, there's LN2, there's dry ice, but this, those are practical. I'm, I'm thinking more and phase change when you actually get into it also not very like, yeah, like something easily accessible that wouldn't take require a whole bunch of work that would get the CPU another 10 degrees cooler. Like I, I wouldn't necessarily expect another 400 megahertz, you know, uplift in core clock, but it could probably do 4.35 with just a couple more millivolts core voltage. And again, like the PBO, like the the fit voltage, the fit limit would actually go up again because the temperature's gone down. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of it. That's like, if this, like, I would actually daily this CPU at these settings. Like, I'd also, at this point, also want to run, like, Linpack, um, an Intel burn test, which I actually, 
Like the the thing, I need to find a version of um, what's it called? Well, a, a version of Linpack that actually runs properly on Ryzen, because that that's like the main thing is a, a lot of the time like well, Linpack doesn't like on Intel Linpack is incredibly hot, and on Ryzen a lot of the time Lin like Linpack actually runs cooler like cooler than it probably should, um, which is kind of like well that's not great. Um, but yeah, so like I I wouldn't just trust Prime ninety five, but I I do trust it quite a bit. Like there's very little that gets as heavy as Prime ninety five is. So yeah, honestly, depending on how you know important the stuff I do with my computer is, I would actually like th these settings right now. Like I would I would totally th daily this. Um. So yeah. Um. That's that's it for the video. So actually, let's do a clean Cinebench run after a restart. Because like at the the thing is like I'm pretty sure it should score over seventeen hundred. Like not significantly over seventeen hundred, just like a little bit over seventeen hundred. Then of course at this point, like now that I've maxed out the CPU, um, you also get to overclock the memory system. Um, Though I'm not sure if I'll do a video about that. Okay, yeah, see? So, a little bit over 1700. So, actually, let, let's just quickly do a calculation how much I improved the multi-core performance. And the thing is, like, uh, keep in mind that at stock, Ryzen boosts more in Cinebench than it boosts in, like, heavier workloads. So, in, like, Prime95, um, it actually runs lower frequencies than it runs for Cinebench R15. So in Prime95, the performance uplift with my overclock is actually bigger than in Cinebench. Um, so that's kind of the thing. But ultimately, like if you if you don't run really heavy workloads, that doesn't really doesn't really matter to you. But if you do run really heavy workloads, well, you know you you get a nice little, like you get a bigger than six percent performance bump. Um, yeah, so that that's six six percent multi core performance increase, which yeah, it's not huge, but the thing is, I'm not losing single threaded performance. If anything, like if anything, the CPU runs slightly cooler because Cinebench now runs at slightly lower voltages. Um, like there there's no real downsides to this except the amount of time you put into it to get your six percent more performance. But you know, like. I've whacked capacitors for several hours onto a GPU to get 10 megahertz more core clock. So asking me about whether doing like overclocking your Ryzen by uh, 200 megahertz is worth it or not. Pro like I'm probably not the right person to ask that kind of question. Um, also, I'm comparing it against PBO, which PBO was probably scoring a, sli a slightly better than stock. Anyway, um... Yeah, that's it. So uh, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions now in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. Um, both of those help out immensely with running the channel. Uh, they allow me to do things like, say, buy a Ryzen 5 3600 so I can make videos like this one. And, and well, there's uh, like the, basically all the videos with this CPU. So, um, yeah, uh, that is it for the video. Thank you for watching and uh, goodbye.